see that little pocket. Mm -hmm. So um, that's something unique about off-road is that um, you run into things. <laughs> and so uh, these tubes, on the one hand, you want to make them really um, thin wall and tiny because they're taking really low loads. You know, it's a 300 pound car. Uh, on the other hand, if you have uh, super thin walls, they're easy to dent. So then, then we come back to, well, if they're going to be heavy anyway to take dents, do we really need to put that up there? These are all questions you have to answer. Wait, what's the point? Um, so this, this arm has a dent in it right here. Yeah. That's probably because it's a very thin wall tube. Yeah. So tubing comes in um, gauges. And so like 028 is the very, very thin wall. That's so thin that you can almost squeeze it and feel it move. Um, the next step, then 035, 049. 065 or 060, 083, 090. Those are your typical wall thicknesses. This is, a, this is a reasonably stout tube, but like a half inch tube with that size as an upper arm could take a lot of load. It's not at all weak. So you're saying we don't care about, it, it, the reason why we're making it that long is to make the forces less, yeah. but if it's that strong anyway, anyway, it doesn't matter, we could just have a short. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I can't answer these questions, but I'm giving you the pros and cons and issues and um, what, you know. But the pros of having it up there wasn't just a load strength thing, it was getting the chassis the right size, the frame, yes, and getting your roll right. centers right, yes, and all that. That's right. Yeah. So that wasn't really a strength thing. Right, right. It also improves the load in the lower arm, which is highly loaded. Okay, um, so you, they, you can see they use a round member for the upper. That's because that only takes tinge compression. The lower they have a square member or a rectangular. And that's because the, um, it is in some bending due to the spring load. So that's a, that's a clever solution there to make the lower one a square cross section to be better for bending or a rectangular tall cross section. They do a nice job on their spring package because somehow they got a shock that has an interval spring. You see, this one has a coil spring. This one must have the spring inside it. They're actually pretty common. I've seen yeah, them on a few yeah. different ones. Yeah. Uh, so that means that their packaging problem is much less, you know, yeah. and they can get that to really tuck into the A-arm. They can get a pretty vertical spring for good motion ratio. They've got it actuated far outboard almost to the lower ball joint. Um, nice, that's a nice package. Uh, they still have a small distance between their upper and lower joints. You can see all these cars at ride height are having the upper arms go in a lot to the, so they're trying to get even more than 10 inches of ride height. Oh, or actually we have to be careful. There's no driver this far. So once you put another 160 pounds of driver, it's gonna drop. I think this is SDSU, both of these. Um, similar design here. They have front steer clearly here. Uh, this one, oh, they, they, so they have this upper ball joint outside the rim. See that? And as well here, to the side of the tire. That's nicely protected. That's a nice design. It's not absurdly high. Uh, but it does uh, give you more spindle height and makes easier packaging in there. Uh, this one I can now see what's going on here. Uh, nice that they have their, remember that this is the highly loaded arm because it has the, the more force, the 13 over four, and it has the spring load on it. And they have those loads fed into triangulated points on the frame. The upper, um, arm is less load, and so they have it feeding into the middle of a tube. We never like to put loads into the middle of a tube because that's bending, but um, the upper arm is the best choice. If, you, if you're going to choose something to go into the middle of a tube, upper arm is a pretty good choice for that. Uh, the shock load looks like it's <coughs> going into probably a triangulator point, but I can't really tell. Oh, so we haven't talked about triangulation at all. Um, so I'll, I'll have to do another discussion on that. I've talked to just briefly with the um, structure team.
front steer here. Um, looks like a very tight package. That may be their own rack. I'm not sure. This is a kind of interesting design for their upper A arm. Um, they have a bin here to get around the shock. Uh, this is a simple solution to give you more space. Uh, instead of an, an upper A arm that has a narrow V, give it a wide V. Now that that shock can fit through that space easier. Um, so they, they give it a wide V and they give it a bend. I'd rather not give it a bend, but that's not too bad of a bend. Uh, so that looks like it's actually the way outboard on there. This one is just outside the rim, next to the tire, upper ball joint. This picture, I'd rather have that point further out, but if I put that point further out, we're going to hit there and we're going to lean the spring over. So this is, I think, the compromise you run into when, you, when your upper ball joint and your lower ball joint are close together. It's, it's tough to pull that off. Uh, they do have a hard and very, this uh, spring load is being fed into um, a well triangulated joint on the frame. So that's a very strong joint right there. I had some others. What out my pictures there? Oh, that's rear suspension. Okay. Um, I think I have some others at the end. Here's some of these are good and some are not so good. It's good to you know see what works, what doesn't. Um, these, this car does not look like it was made by engineers. Um, look at this rear spring bridge. You've got great motion ratio, I've got to give them that. But um, the structure supporting that is all bending. So very briefly, and let's talk about why bending is important. Um, break that stick. OK, now give those two to someone else and ask them to break it. Okay, so every person that I asked to break the stick chose bending to break it. And that's because you all know bending is the weak mode of sticks and things. <laughs> you, you didn't pull it like this. You didn't. Well, you, can, <laughs> you can break it by buckling, um, but um, it, it, it's harder to break by buckling than it is just to bend it. Um, you didn't twist it, although that will break it. You all know intuitively, bending is how things break the easiest. And so from an engineer's perspective, if you want to make things uh, strong, or you want to make them lightweight, or both, no bending. <laughs> uh, I remember my, in my Formula SA class, when I was a, a beginning my, my um, senior year, the previous team got up and gave a lecture, just like I'm giving you. And the guy wrote one thing on the board. And it was the wisest thing. <laughs> I don't think he wrote anything else. That's all he wrote. Just that card for no penny. It was light and strong. Uh, so, bending. Yep. So they would have a major issue with the roll cage too, right? In, like. Would tell at you what that, you're at? that bend at the yeah right there. Oh yeah, so the roll cage is a difficult one because um, in order to get the driver in and out of the car, you're going to have to have a square here. As soon as you have a face that is a square and not a triangle, <coughs> you have bending almost always. But you got to get the driver now. So um, what are you going to do? And uh, similarly, the driver probably doesn't want to look through a space that has a triangle through. They could, and, and truck tr 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 types do, uh, but um, they also have a big, big windshield. Uh, so you can see this shock mount is also in the middle of a tube. <laughs> oh. um, this shock mount, middle of a tube, and then they put a cross brace in. Well, but the load on it is that way. <laughs> they have a joint here and a joint here, and they chose to put the shock in the middle. So, yeah. Uh, going back to the green car uh, for the back uh, suspension, when you talked about it, couldn't they just put just like a rod 
above it. Yeah, right. Uh, this black rod. Right. Why doesn't this black rod go from here to there? Yeah. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. Now, actually, in, in, a, in a limited view, it would be because now it looks like that's a hard point. But now think of this triangle here. When I put a force on there, it's simply going to make that little triangle do that because that's not a hard point. So it, triangulation only works if the next thing next to it is also triangulated. So typically, the, the only it's not feasible to get triangles through the upper structure. You have got to get the driver out. Uh, the only place you can get triangles through is through the lower structure. Triangle. They, so that two I'd rather go there, but at least they do have a, something like a diagonal. So triangle, triangle. This would be easy to make another triangle. And then we need something from these two points to the spring perch that's a triangle. And we'll see other joint cars that do that. Uh, so here, we got the spring point going into a triangle, um, but we don't really have triangles from the roll hoop to that point. Okay. Lots of cars put the spring right in the middle of a tube. I mean, you can do it. Um, and maybe if the crash protection, I know there's a lot of rules on how heavy these tubes have to be just for crash protection. It may be that they're so big that you can afford to have that bending. So that's the flip side of the argument, is if you have to do it anyway for crash, if the tube can take it, they can take it. And you can calculate whether they can take it or not. But in general, um, the judges will be more impressed if you make good one of the points, uh, unless you have a really good explanation. Uh, this is a nice rear suspension for triangulation. We got that load being fed very close to the um, upper ball joint of the rear, and we have the upper load going into another triangle here. And it looks like that is well almost triangulated. We can't count on the upper part here, just like we can't count on that one. But the FAA will tell you how, how bad that is. Um, the cost, however, is look at they had to build this rear frame. Other cars don't have a rear frame at all. <clears throat> so you save weight and time and money. In the bottom, this is good. We got a lower ball joint or lower arm going into a fairly hard point there. And the upper one's not so hard, but they put a cross brace where it matters because you do have longitudinal loads right there. That little cross brace will double the strength of that point. Uh, triangulation will give you 10 times, 100 times more strength, but a cross brace will double. Uh, there's a nice um, package of the spring into a hard point, lower arm into a fairly hard point. Here's a tiny spindle and the compromises they had to make there. Uh, another spring going into the middle of the tube. <laughs> another spring going into a hard point. This one is hard, and the way I know that is they also have this tube right here. So as long as this, it's usually easy to get triangulation from that member forward. That's just the side of the car. If you then take this member and you have a, a strong tube go there and another, any tube really, it doesn't, doesn't have to be a big one. Any tube going from there to there and another one going to there, that's now a triangulated point. And so an ideal place to put a spring. See, tiny spindle, not much ground clearance. Uh, we got a lot of bending on the lower arm, but they probably had to package. That's this is the cost of making your upper arms narrow. Almost never a good idea because your spring just doesn't fit. Uh, that's a nice um, hard point for that. They got that way outboard. That's good. There's a rear steer. Not seeing much there. This is odd here. Um, I don't know why they did this. Here, um, the wheels are in front. You can see how that A-arm is now kind of going to the front of the car. That's going to make higher forces in the arms. There's no way around it. Uh, this, is the, this is fine. A V is fine. Um, it's also fine to have one arm purely lateral and the other arm trailing. So wide V, 
that's fine, but don't do that. At least I, I can't think of a good reason to do that. They probably had one. Uh, oh, a nice triangulation on this one. We got the spring going under hard point, triangle, triangle, triangle. Um, this spring is fairly close to that hard point, so not so bad, you know? I mean, they got a little bit of ending there. But it's, it's a lot better than, you know, putting the spring like there. So here's kind of a classic decision is, uh, and this is from the rear as far as I can tell, is if you have a trailing arm suspension, you're probably gonna have a hard point around here. So you could have your spring anchor here, but if you do that, you're probably not gonna be able to get the spring to go all the way back to actually where the wheel is. It's actually in the middle of the arm. So that will make for a heavier arm because it has to take bending. The other option, uh, so this one does the same thing. We're anchoring the spring to the uh, fire, to the main roll hoop, but that puts the spring load in the middle of the arm, heavier arm. Your other option, well, there's another one of that same design. Um, we'll go back to that one in a bit. Uh, the other option is to actuate the spring off of the, uh, a new hard point created by the frame then you can actuate it directly off the upright, get a better motion ratio, but you have to build that rear frame. Uh, here's another example. This is, for triangulation, this is very nice. We got to go right into there. Now this is an open face right here, technically. It's a four-sided figure, so that could distort. Technically speaking, you should have a member from there to that corner, to, so it's two triangles. But if you do that, you think of the so another way to cheat that is to put in like a little bit of reinforcement in this area to kind of make it into a, a round. Uh, this is bizarre. <laughs> look how long their arm is. Five inches. Um, look at this shape. <laughs> I don't get that one. Okay. But they do have good motion ratio. Well, maybe not. <laughs> that's how far out it is. They did get their spring vertical. Uh, let's see. So that's strange, putting it in the middle of that joint. Why not make that point there? They could have done that. Uh, and then why not make that point further out? It looks like there's plenty of room in the upper arm. Okay, we could do that forever. Uh, <laughs> how useful is that? To, Look at other cars here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we'll go back, you know, back and forth between theory and how people pull it off. Let's see. So we talked about a lot about front suspension. Talked about the A-arm analysis. Let me make sure I finished all the issues here. Oh, roll center height. So this roll center, as we're sitting right now, is five inches off the ground. That's probably reasonable. The ins oh, we want to look at how does the um, camera change when we go up and down. My instant center is off the screen. I can't see it. So um, that means it must be far away. Let's look at how does the camera change Right now it's negative 2.7, but we would just want to know, how does it change when I move my vehicle? So, oh, there's those blue dots. Actually, they were closer than I thought. Uh, yeah, because that I don't want this. Let me get, let me get those um, all right, purple dots further out. So to do that, I'm going to have to move the upper point up. You can see purple dot too close, purple dot far away. Now when I drop my car, let me drop it. Did I drop it one inch before or two inches? Okay. Let's look at how the camera changes. There's one inch. Oops. And we have a 0.7 degree change in the outside wheel. I think that's less than before. 1.4 before. 
So that would be a better off-road suspension, um, but not a good uh, road racing suspension. Uh, let's look at how does the blue and the green track together very nicely. So you have the same roll moment no matter what height the chassis is. We can look at roll. Now to do roll, I click that one. Now I click this left to right. So this is how this suspension is not as good for road racing because if my car rolls, let me go three degrees, that would be a lot of roll for road racing. Three degrees of, oh, I have to, you have to hold the mouse and keep it held. There's three degrees of roll. My outside wheel has two degrees of positive camber. So that would be a bad road racing car, but for off-road with a rounded tire, who cares? Okay. Let's see. Ah, steering. Click this button and we didn't get steering arms. And this will tell you the bump steer of the vehicle. And the inches that they're referring to right here are usually uh, at the tire. Like how far, if this is the rim and then this is like the widest part of the tire. I don't know if it's at the rim. It's probably at the rim. Um, then if, if you have bump steer, then that's going to be doing that. And so what is that difference between the two planes? It's starting out at zero. Now this should be terrible because I have these long arms and I have a short tie rod. Let's see if it, it's terrible. Let me uh, bump the chassis two inches. So I've got 0.0375 inches of uh, steer that the wheels did. That's quite a lot. Uh, now, let me change the location of that arm. Let me pull that in so that we kind of have our um, eyeball bump steer method. <laughs> I'm just making a line through those and a line through those. And now let me bump the car again two inches. And I have 0.25 of bump steer. That's still a fair amount, but that's less than before, right? What was it before? Oh, three cents. Oh, huh. not, not a lot less. Uh, what did they do wrong here? So if you point it in the wrong direction, it's going to be terrible as well. Two inches of bump. Now we have a quarter inch of steer. Yeah, that's horrible. Okay. Bump steer, you'll, um, you really need a three-dimensional program to do a look at it. Um, but honestly, I have to think more why that wasn't better. Don't you want to point out the instant settings of the... Yeah, I thought I did that. Maybe I didn't get them just right. Um, I guess I want to be a little bit inclined. There. I'll try it one more time. Two inches of bump. There, now I have zero. Yeah, so I think I didn't incline it just right. Yeah. So that has no bump steer. Look at that. I can, I can go way up there and way down there. The wheels are basically straight ahead. Okay, so that's fun. Um, everyone can play with that. It's a free program. Back in my day, we had um, cardboard cutouts, and um, literally, that's how we learned suspension design with cardboard. That's fun. Okay, so I think we've done a good job on double arm suspension design. Uh, here's a more sophisticated program example that can do the, the, the um, in and out of the page. And it can also do the motion ratio of the spring right there. Although um, SolidWorks might be better for the motion ratio because now you can actually package the spring and you can see what's going to hit each other. Okay. <coughs> oh, scrub. That was one more thing we want to look at. Look at the horizontal change of the tire. three-eighths of an inch. I don't remember the numbers, but qualitatively that tire is not 
moving that much compared to when we started the day, left and right. You want the contact batch to be relatively stable. Uh, all that, so good. Here's an interesting discussion on, this shows another program that, that you can get um, similar, but this is a three-dimensional program. load analysis for lateral. The longitudinal loads on the A-arms, that's probably our next topic. So now we're doing a top view to do longitudinal analysis. Let's just look at the lower arm. Okay, so we're going to put a force on it like that. That could be acceleration, that could be braking. Uh, it's going to, let me put the steering arm here. There's the tie rod. So that's the steering arm, and that's the tie rod. So when that force goes on it, it's going to be applied to the contact patch. Now there is a lever arm right here, call it little a. It wants the whole wheel has to pivot about the ball joint axis. So we have this force times that little a, and then you can instantly calculate your tie rod force because that's just the offset b. And this force also gets, trans so the torque of the wheel about the A is taken by the tie rod. But now that force gets put right back on the A arm right there. Moved over, if you did the statics, that's what will happen. And so this is where you can see having a big angle here is helpful. So if you have, um, that's method of joints, remember that from statics? I don't know if you, did you do enough statics problems to know that the bigger this angle, the less the forces in those arms? Does that seem familiar? It just seems like if that's bigger, then that's going to be able to absorb more of the vertical work. Yeah. Like yeah. Than, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you remember method of joints. That's the best way to analyze this. F, reaction A, reaction B. And it is the vertical component of this B right there that's going to resist that. So if, you're, if you have a very narrow angle between your arms, then I'll do it, I'll do it with uh, length. We know that if this force vector is that long, then it's going to have to be resisted by a force vector that's equally long. So that length is the same as that length. If, it ha if this um, arm here has a very narrow angle, I'll make it extreme, then that means that the force in the arm is going to be huge, just simple vectors. Okay, so reasonably wide. Uh, obviously, you're limited though, because you need to, if this is the front wheel, you need to turn this wheel. And so at some point, um, the rim is going to hit there. And so now you can see why for front suspension, if you want a lot of turning, it's better to have, instead of one straight lateral and one back, it's better to have one arm like that and one arm like that. Now that wheel can turn both directions and not hit the arm on either side. Longitudinal is much simpler than lateral. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left. We can do a number of different things. Uh, let's see what you want to do. Let's go. One option is look at um, solid rear axle suspension, four, four link, for example. We could, let me just mention them all, and then we can uh, decide. We could look at powertrain and acceleration. 
and transmission, transmission ratios. Uh, the engine, the torque curve, CVT. And we could look at some structure design questions. That sounds good in 10 minutes. <clears throat> or it probably depends who's here, uh, which teams do we have represented the most. Uh, who's powertrain team? Three of us, okay. Who is suspension team? <laughs> and who's structure team or chassis team? Well, pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there any preference? Or any burning questions that would, one of those would be good? We're really um, leaning away from a solid rear axle. Okay. So I don't know if we. I can skip that. We can skip that. Let me cross that off the list. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Is that is that correct, or would you guys? Yeah, I agree. With you. Just from looking at most cars. I, yeah. I've not. I don't think we should go that solid. Too risky. I don't. Yeah, I think we would. There's too many things that could go wrong with us just being able to perform a competition. Hmm. And I think we have the ability to do it kind of here. So I'm okay with that as long as the team's willing to work hard. Because uh, it's, it's definitely more work to do it in the rear. There's just more parts. Yeah. Uh, from talking with everyone, I think that we're willing to spend the work too. So to give us the best shot at performing well. Uh -huh. um, what exactly is the more work? It was like, so for more parts. Um, more parts. <laughs> That's that comes up. More parts. Yeah, a four-link rear. Um, so let's make sure. If, so if we're going to decide that now, let's make sure we know the issues. Um, so the big, a, a semi-trailing arm rear suspension is pretty simple. Right. Uh, you got one link on that side, one on the other. Uh, the big work is the half shafts and the CVs. Right. So a solid axle doesn't have those. Uh, so so it's, it's, just, just, it's just one bar all the way across. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And CVs are, I don't know, sometimes they're a great deal of work, depending on how easy it is to mesh them with what they need to mesh with. Oh, and also the uprights. So the hub carrier here, this is more work in an um, independent than a solid axle. Yeah. There is no hub carrier in a solid axle. There's a lot out there on the CV joints, though. OK. There's a of information and they're so commonly used across the board. I feel like I don't True. know. True, yeah, it's been solved a lot. So yeah. that's in your favor. Yeah. yeah. So solved problems are better than unsolved problems. <laughs> yeah. I feel like if we went with the solid rear axle because we're scared of the work, but I think that we should question why we went on this project and chose this project in the first place. Well it's too late for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm trying to work with the amount of work you're willing to do. I think we're willing to work hard. What I saw is the solid rear axle is easier to do, but harder to get right. Because mm -hmm. I don't Could know. What, I just did a little bit of brief research, but there were a lot of people that were like, yeah, we have the solid rear axle, but it was super heavy, or it had some oh. kind of problems. And so my thought of that is copy uh, the big boys. <laughs> so so don't, don't copy Baja. Copy. Uh, Trophy trucks. Every trophy truck out there has a solid axle. And they seem to do very well. So they also have like a five hundred horsepower engineer. Yeah, but it, well but I'm saying that they're not choosing to go independent. Yeah. They could. They certainly could. But they, they are they are choosing to go solid axle. Um, in the rear, and so the, this four link design everyone's using, and it's basically unbeatable. So. so, does the axle go in between that like casing or the housing or that? Uh, the drive. This would have a drive shaft because it has a ring and pinion. Right. Yeah. So then, okay. Yeah. So you so mount your springs directly onto that. They're mounting them here, right? You can see in the middle. I think oh, that's right. to reduce the shock velocity because they have such high travel, but. Um, I think most people otherwise would put the foot back. We don't need a front thread or anything. 
You don't need an upright. Right. There's no upright. Yep. Yep. It's just um, hub bearing tube. It is your decision. Ah, oh, it's I'm so a hard decision. <laughs> <laughs> Every time we make it like back to 50-50. <laughs> 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 um, really <laughs> yes, yeah, so you can definitely do a solid axle wrong. There's many ways to do it wrong and badly. Um, so don't don't make that the reason. It's okay to, to go independent. I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to say it's the wrong decision to go independent. But don't do some of these horrible things. <laughs> <laughs> so swing axle, um, infinite rear roll stiffness, um, very heavy, lots of uh, unsprung weight. Most of these are really awkward. This is the only good one I saw right here. They're, they're basically doing a, um, it's almost a trophy truck in that design. Yeah. So. So let's see, but we only have five minutes now, and I'm kind of, but that's, that's an important discussion. Let's see, what can I do in five minutes if you want to maybe just look at pictures? <laughs> um, actually, I could do power training. This besides, is besides the work plus work thing, what are the, like, what is the really, what are the pros of doing solid rocks? What can we gain? I just um, see things that we can lose. Probably lighter weight overall. Uh, less cost, you're not paying for CV joints or differential. I rate less cost. Simpler, so there's a, Jay Novak was um, an engineer at Ford, he went on to be um, a well-known racer, race engineer and racer. And he, he says, I think, I, this is an your senior design report, or instructions, the part that is not there weighs nothing, costs <laughs> nothing, and cannot break, and has perfect quality. So just in general, the more parts you have, the more parts you have to track, design well. Um, so a four-link rear has four parts. Um, so we have to do independent. Is a a semi-trailing or independent?